talking to you about your career that's going well, 45 years? Yeah, I guess so, 67. Um, where did you grow, grow up? Three. I grew up in, uh, I was born in Sundance, Wyoming. Yeah. Uh, we left there when I was six years old and went to Upton, Wyoming. Graduated high school there. Went to the University of Wyoming for four years. United States Army for three years. University of Wyoming for three more years, law school. And then off to Casco, Wyoming to practice. When did you start practicing before? In law school? And when, when were you in law school? About, about what time? Um, 64 through 67. Okay. Um, the first reference, I, I read about you, the first reference I read about you was in a book called A Murder in Madness. Yeah. That was Joe Esquivel. Uh, and um, that was probably 1965 or 66? 66 was when I got involved in that case. I was a senior in law school, and they started what they called the Wyoming Defender Aid Program. And that program would uh, provide a law student to a lawyer who was appointed in a criminal case to assist. And you were appointed to uh, assist who? I was appointed to assist Jerry Spence and a guy named Ray Whitaker, who were appointed to represent this guy, Joe uh, Jerry Spence, who's he? Oh, he's a country lawyer in Wyoming, but he has done a few things in his career. And uh, you started working with him in 1965? Yeah. 66. 66. 1966. And tell me about that case. Um, well, that case will take this whole interview. You might want to know about it. Uh, Joe Escabel was a Hispanic. He was married to a white woman. And she had been the, uh, the head cheerleader in Rollins, Wyoming. And uh, quite a quite a good-looking and well-known woman. Uh, they got into a scrap one morning, and she went down to the welfare office in Rollins where her mother worked. And Joe walked in right behind her and walked up and shot her in the head with a deputy sheriff standing right there, armed with his gun drawn, who was frozen and did nothing. <coughs> Joe walked back out, and, and then of course got arrested. Um, I did the initial interviews of Esquivel and Rollins. Uh, that was what they wanted me to do, was go over there and spend time with him and interview him. And I told Ray and Jerry that I thought there was a really good mental defense in his case, that he was pretty screwed up. And so we started working on that mental defense. And uh, that was when Jerry Spence did one of the more brilliant things that I've ever seen him do. Uh, what happened was the Wyoming legislature had just changed the law regarding uh, the insanity defense and had completely rewritten the statute and had basically messed up so that there was no procedure in the statute then at that point to determine uh, a, a plea of not triable by reason of insanity. They just, they just removed that procedure and forgot to fix it. And so there was a void there. So Jerry went and goes to the prosecutor. And he said, well, we got a big problem here. He said, uh, it, it might require you to dismiss the case. But he said, you and I have been friends for all these years. And he said, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you an idea about what I think you can do. I think you can file a motion, uh, a motion for a declaratory judgment, asking the court to declare that he's trial. And then we could have a trial on that. And, working out. What Oscar didn't know and what Jerry was doing was getting it into a civil case. And as soon as he filed that, we started deposing everybody else. <laughs> so we took depositions and everybody had anything to do with that case. Uh, Joe was sent off to the state hospital for evaluation, of course. And at one point, we got a court order, a secret court order, as it turns out and got on an airplane and flew down to Evanston and, and uh, just barred into the, uh, to the state hospital down there and the photographer took pictures of some of the horrors that were in that place. And those figures were the case. It finally goes to trial on the declaratory judgment. Uh, before it even gets to the jury, the prosecutor gives up and says, I agree that it's not trial. So he goes back to the state hospital. Uh, a few years later, he comes back out we start the trial process again, 
Again, before it ends, uh, the prosecutor says, I agree, he's still not tribal. And uh, finally, after I think about eight years that he'd been in there, Joe said, I, don't, I can't take this any longer, I want to have my trial. So we agreed that he was tribal and went to trial on the, the major case. And uh, Joe wound up getting acquitted on the on basis of insanity. Jerry tried most of the case, I had a little part in it. Um, <clears throat> and we told Joe when he got out, uh, what you need to do is stay away from Rollins because there's a lot of hostility to him about you. If you go to Rollins, they'll kill you. Well, Joe couldn't resist. Uh, a few days after he got out, he went down to Rollins and sure enough, they killed him. And uh, the bartender who shot him then got tried and sentenced to about 25 years in prison. That case led to, has led to a long time friendship with uh, Jerry Spence. Forever, ever since 66, uh, he and I have been very close friends. And we've done cases together, we've done a lot of things together. You uh, got interested in, in during that time in, in mental health and uh, started exploring a thing called psychotron. Well, that came from a different place and it didn't have anything to do with mental health. All right. Uh, well, <coughs> That, that happened in about 76, probably, 76 or 77. Um, I was dean of the National College for Criminal Defense at that point in Houston. And uh, we'd been running a program kind of similar to the one you see going on here at uh, Rusty Duncan now. It was a lecture program, people standing up and giving lectures. And then we switched to a, a more of a NIDA kind of program, trial practice kinds of stuff. Uh, but I was not happy with either one of those formats from the standpoint that we had some of the best lawyers in the country, uh, people like Jerry Spence and people like Al Krieger, uh, who I think is one of the greatest cross-examiners I've ever been. And Krieger could come and give a lecture and tell people, here's how I do it. And the people could say, okay, I'm going to go home and do it the way Albert Krieger does it. Uh, because he says, always ask those questions. And, you know, Where's Albert Krieger? Uh, from? He's from Miami. Okay. Uh, so what, what I thought was, you know, we're creating, we're creating carpenters here. You know, what we're doing is we're telling people, do it Albert's way and it will work. But nobody taught Albert to do it Albert's way. That came out of somewhere inside Albert. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do was try to figure out a way to teach these young lawyers that were coming down there to find that within themselves. So it's, it's their, it's what they, what comes out of them that they put into the trial and then they're not being carpenters but they're being artists and, and the artists are in the cases and the carpenters are not. That was my theory. So, Spence and I had worked with a guy named John Johnson, who was a psychiatric social worker in Wyoming, and John would come help, would help him with, uh, down at school occasionally. So I asked John one day, I told John this dilemma, and I said, you got any ideas? And he said, no, but let me, let me work on it. And so about six months later, John said, I think I found it. He had a little blue book uh, uh, on psychodrama, I think uh, the author's name is Black or something. He said, I don't know much about this, but I looked at it. He said, this might work. This might be a, a thing that will help accomplish what you want to accomplish. So we had a big meeting at my house, Jerry Spence and I and John Johnson and uh, John Simmons, who was, who was helping me at the college at that time. And uh, we decided to try to do a psychodrama program. And we got a guy named Don, what's Don's last name? Clarkson. Don Clarkson from Washington, D.C. to come help us. And we did a program in uh, Jackson. The first one we ever did was in Jackson. It was pretty much a pure, a pure psychodrama program. And it was, uh, Clarkson had all these exercises we did, and it was scary. Um, it was totally experimental. But it worked so well. Um, the people that came there and really got into it went away feeling like it was the best thing that ever happened to them. It changed their lives in many ways. It changed the way they practice law. It changed a lot of things. That was the feedback we got after we left. So we did several more of them. 
Uh, and then I left the college and the college stopped doing it. And uh, Jerry had become enamored of the process and finally formed the Trial Lawyers College. Well, that was 94. Yeah, and then we started doing it uh, in the Trial Lawyers. There was a big hiatus where there were no psychotron programs on my goal. Right. And then the Trial Lawyers College was formed. And since then, that what we started back there in those early days has been refined uh, to the point where uh, you think that Marino, the guy that invented psychodrama, actually invented it for lawyers because it is so perfect for well, what we're working we're way ahead of ourselves. Since yes, we are. Start. we are. Uh, back in the 70s, you, uh, you were in Wyoming and you had some fantastic cases. Uh, you went to Wounded Knee. I went to Wounded Knee, uh, NACDL. Um, started a uh, wounded knee project where we were representing people that were charged up there for free. Um, there's a background to that if you want to hear it. Sure. Uh, Charlie Tesman was president of NACDL and the... Charlie Tesman from Dallas. Charlie Tesman from Dallas. One of the founders of PCDLA. That's right. And the annual convention was in Dallas. And it was the old days of NACDL. It was a chowder and marching society. We didn't do anything very serious. We just got together and uh, party. And Charlie was quite good at that. Anyhow, we're, we're there. Party drink. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, when Emmett Colvin took over from me as dean, uh, he was down at the college for a while. We did a lot of talking about Charlie because he practiced with him for years. And he said the one, one thing I always regretted was going to the office on Monday mornings because I knew I was going to have to fire a secretary, Charlie, and hire that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been with Charlie when he did that a couple of times. <laughs> so Charlie uh, had this initiative to go to Wounded Knee. No. What oh. happened was we got a telegram from a guy named Joe Beeler, who's a lawyer in Miami. Right. Now. And Joe was out there with what they call the Wounded Knee Legal Offense Defense Committee. All right. And the telegram just said there's all these Indians out here and South Dakota lawyers won't represent them and they're without counsel and they need lawyers and it's a major crisis. So we sent a guy named Bob Heaney from Ocean City, Maryland uh, out there to look into it. Heaney came back and reported we needed to get involved. And the next thing that happened, a bunch of us went to a meeting in Rapid City, South Dakota to look into doing these cases. Um, <laughs> Mark Lane, the guy that wrote the Conspiracy, first conspiracy book about the Kennedy assassination, uh, was there dressed like an Indian and had beads on him. He was crazy. He was just crazy. And uh, he he started telling us in the meeting that, okay, here's what we're going to do. The defense we're going to assert is the 1868 treaty defense, and uh, that's the only defense we're interested in asserting, and that's what we're going to do. At which point, about half of the NACD people there got up and walked out and said, and so they left. Uh, the rest of us uh, just decided we would ignore Mark Lane and do what we wanted to do. Um, so we stayed. And then the next day we went out to Porcupine, which is a little village on the reservation, to meet our clients that were going to sign to us. Who was your client? My client was uh, Viola Redbird. Uh, and <laughs> it was a strange thing because the, the young uh, Indian woman that, uh, that met me to introduce me to Viola Redbird was named Tonya Ackerman, which is interesting. Yes. Not related, but interesting. Hmm. So she, sure? took, she took me in to introduce me to Tonya, to, uh, to Viola. Viola was, uh, nobody knew for sure, but looked to be somewhere between 85 and 90 years old. She couldn't stand up straight. She was very palsy, and she talked to you like this. Hands would be shaking and her head would be shaking and so forth. And she was charged with assaulting a federal agent during the wounded knee thing. Uh, I called up the U.S. Attorney and I said, uh, have somebody take a look at Viola and see if you want to go ahead with this prosecution for assaulting a federal agent. I said, she couldn't assault a dog. And uh, about two days later, he called up and said, we dismissed it. And so I lost my case. I didn't have a case anymore. And then uh, Albert Krieger had 
agreed to represent Russell Means in a murder case that had taken place just off the reservation at that time, and then got involved in a big case down in Miami and couldn't do it. And so he asked me if I would take over the Russell Means case, which I did. And uh, in the summer of 76, uh, I tried that up in Rapid City, South Dakota. When did you meet a young woman named Kat Then, 76. She, I called Jay Shulman, who was head of the National Jury Project, and said, you got somebody you can send up to help me with the Russell Means trial. And uh, Jay said, yeah, I think I've got the perfect, perfect person. Her name's Kathy Bennett. And, and so arrangements got made, and she showed up, and I picked her up at the airport. This was the second case that she ever worked on. She worked on one prior case. She worked on the case of Morris Seeds? Yes. The death penalty case? Yes. Atlanta. That's right. So anyhow, she shows up there, and we, we start having conversations about her theories and mine and so forth. And uh, I become uh, interested in a lot of the ideas that she had. And thought what were those ideas? ideas? Uh, they, they had to do with, they were the things that I wound up teaching people for years about how to do the jury board hire, and that is um, very open questions uh, of jurors about how they feel about things, and, and very little of trying to lecture jurors about the law and stuff like that. Don't do any of that. Just figure out what the um, five or six or seven or eight uh, problems are with your case that you're worried about with the jury and start talking to them about those. You know, here's something that frightens me. Um, tell me how you feel about it. The, the big issue we had in the Russell Means case was uh, community prejudice. Uh, the, the surveys that we done there showed that around 90% of the people in Rapid City uh, had already decided that Russell was guilty of his murder. And so the board deer process was going to be a difficult one. The case had been venue transferred out to eastern South Dakota, Sioux Falls, where that's a long way from where I grew up. I grew up close to Rapid City. And uh, it was foreign territory for me. I'd have been more comfortable in Rapid City. So I went to the judge, Marshall Young was his name, and I said, Judge, I'll make you a deal. I said, I'll withdraw the venue change if you give me uh, individual sequestered board iron. And he said, that's a deal I can't refuse. <laughs> so he did. So we got individual sequestered board iron. We went through uh, 240 jurors, I think, in the board iron we did in that case. And uh, Russell Means is a powerful, uh, articulate guy. did the first before Dyer of the first juror. And of course I was quite nervous because I was doing something I'd never done before in terms of jury work. I hadn't done that kind of a board. So I was nervous about it and I didn't do it very well. But I did it better than any other board I had ever done because it was, a, it, was a, it was effective. But Russell had been through one prior wounded knee trial. Uh, so he had pretty significant trial experience. We had a little room off the courtroom that uh, we were using as an office. We walked in and Russell had a book of some kind in his hand. He walked in and slammed it down on the table and he said, that's the worst goddamn four die I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> that's the way Russell and I started in that case. But then it got a lot better after that. He started, uh, we started getting along pretty well. Um, what was the result of that trial? Well, I want to tell you one more story about it. I think it's going to make it a fascinating story. Um, I told you Russell was articulate and, and so forth, and, and I really did not want him to testify because I didn't want him to have to put up with cross-examination. But I did want the jury to know the story about what happened in this part of that thing. So uh, one day I just walked up and filed with the clerk a notice of appearance and, and Russell Means as co-counsel in the case. Just filed it. That's all I did. And uh, we got to opening statement time. I just stood up and I said, Judge, uh, Mr. Means will make the opening statement. And he said, approach the bench. He up there and he said, he can't make the opening statement. I said, he's counsel in the case, you know, he'll do an entry appearance. He looks over the clerk and said, let me see. The clerk looks at it and said, he looks at it and says, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, so Russell gets up and does this you know, amazing uh, presentation about what happened in the bar event. 
where he was and where everybody else was and what happened. And it was just extremely powerful. And of course, he couldn't be cross-examined about it. And it really set the tone for how the rest of that case went. He was acquitted. Now, was it? You had your client give a, tell his story, an opening statement, yes. about what happened in the murder case, yes. and about his fears and anxieties, yes. and how he acted in self-defense. No, it wasn't self-defense. He never. His position was that he never went in the, the, the restroom where the guy was killed. Oh, somebody, somebody, somebody else. The did. story was this: this this guy walked into the restroom in this bar. And Russell and Dickie Marshall allegedly followed him in. The people heard a couple of shots. The two came back out. They rushed in. And he's lying dead on the floor. Right. Um, and Marshall was tried before I wound up in the men's case and convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Right. Uh, so one of the issues we dealt with was keeping that away from the jury. Uh, so that, that way we emotionally limited that out. Right. And so that couldn't be mentioned. And there's more about that too. But anyhow, we. We tried the case. Russell was acquitted, but during the, the during the, when the jury was deliberating, the thought was just smart keeping the Dickie Marshall conviction out. The, the jury sent a, a note in to the judge. It said, "Since the co-defendant was convicted of murder, would it be proper for us to convict means of manslaughter?" <laughs> <laughs> and so, two things came out. One, we realized the jury knew what had happened to Dickie Marshall. And two, I was convinced we were looking at a manslaughter conviction. Ten minutes later, they quit. I don't know what that, I never did figure out what that note was about. I didn't get to talk to any of the jurors because I had to leave town immediately. The sheriff said, there's a death threat from you, you gotta go. So I was escorted out of town by the sheriff's office. Put it back in my mind. So, the idea, so, of this trial, you met Kat Bennett. Yeah. And you, between the two of you, some new ideas came out. A lot, and she, you know, that, that's, that's when I brought Kat Bennett into the, into the college, and uh, well, you see, I was already at the college. Are you at the college? I've been there for two years. All so right. this was during the summer after we'd done our programs, I went up and tried the means case. So then I brought Kat back into the college, and she and I started doing uh, presentations at the college on jury murder. And, um, and then she she did the she, she got involved in the Howard Hughes will case right and uh, sort of got some national prominence uh, on her own about that. She went up to Oklahoma to work on some Indian cases with uh, Governor Isaac. Yeah, she's done. She did a lot of stuff like that. But anyhow, she got some notoriety to the point where 60 Minutes became a program. And um, so they came down to the college one summer and and did a show where they filmed Kathy and I doing our jury board hour. Really? Do you still have that show, copy of it? No, I don't. But it's, it, was, it was quite good. Mike Wallace was there sitting in the front row, and of course I was, I was uh, jiving with Mike occasionally as we were right. doing the thing, you know. Um, it was quite, a, quite an interesting thing. We had a jury, and, and I was doing more dire, and then Kathy would explain the question that I asked, why I asked it, what it meant, uh, how maybe I could have done it if, if better if I'd done it this way, and so we tried it that way. And it was a, it was a real laboratory kind of thing, awfully good. I wish I had it. I think I've got, got it in, uh, I've got a transcript of it. So, you and Kat are, in the late 70s, are, are working on changing the way lawyers pick juries. Yes. And you start teaching it throughout the 80s. The two of you start going out throughout Texas, around the country, teaching this new method of jury selection. All over the country. We, we, change, we change the way people pick We absolutely change the way people pick juries. And how, how did that change come about? Well, we were, we were teaching a lot of people every summer at the college. And uh, they'd come down there and they'd see how we were doing it. And they'd see what we were doing. And they'd go home and throw away all the stuff that they had before uh, and start doing it our way. And they were getting better juries. They were, they what were was the essence of what they were doing? The essence of what we were doing was just, just you know, I, I can teach it in, in time, 10 minutes now. It is, look at your case, and what is it you're concerned about? If it, let's just take an example. You're concerned that your client has a prior conviction. Instead of getting up and saying, now, ladies and gentlemen, you understand the law of this state is 
that you, you may not consider a prior conviction, or you know, whatever the law is you want to tell them about with regard to that. Instead of getting up and giving them a law lecture, you do something like this. You say, I want to tell you something. My client was convicted five years ago for an armed robbery. And you're going to hear about that in this trial. Now, knowing that, how do you think he's going to get a fair trial? Now, that's going to get an answer. And that's going to get everybody else thinking. And then their job at that point, that they take on themselves, you don't have them do it, they just do it. They take on the job to figure out how they're going to get, get him a fair trial. And they start talking about it. Hands start coming up. A lot of people want to talk about it. And I think we should just ignore that. You know, that, that doesn't have anything to do with this case. We should make the judgment on what we hear in this case. And I'll say, then, how many of you agree with that? Yeah, the hands will all go up. Everybody will agree with it. All of a sudden, and, and the subtle thing about that is not, is, is that when you own a concept, then you don't give it up. And so when they invent the law they're going to apply, then they have to live with it. When I tell them what it is, it's mine. And they don't have to live with it. They can ignore me. So that was that's part of the key, is have the jury, have the jury decide they're in Gordon Iron, what they think is important about how they what how they should consider the evidence of trial case. What was it like teaching that concept, uh, innovative concept? It's pretty easy to teach if you're doing it in a, in a laboratory kind of setting where you've got people getting up on their feet with, with actors there playing jurors and they, can, and they can feel how much better it is. They do it and then they say, oh my God, that's so much better than what I've been doing. I can't wait to get home and do it for real. You know? So it's pretty easy to teach. It's not a, there's nothing, there's no, uh, there's nothing bizarre about it. I mean, it's just a natural way to do something. It's the way you, it's the way you do it. People who were sitting around visiting. So after, at, means trial was in '76. Yes. Was it after the means trial that you got introduced to the psychodrama? Yes. And uh, and did you bring Cat Bevan into this uh, psychodrama workshop? I think she was in the first couple of them. Maybe more than that. But yeah, she was. She was there. But Clarkson was the. The psychodramatist. She, Kat didn't understand it, but she was, I mean, she was really into it. I mean, she understood what we were trying to do and how it might be working for us. Uh, but Clarkson was the one who really kind of put it together. Tell us what psychodrama is. Psychodrama was designed by uh, a psychiatrist by the name of Marino out of a frustration at dealing with troubled children. It's very difficult to get children to talk about their problems. They just don't like to do that. And unless, if you're a psychiatrist, unless you can get your patients to talk about a problem, then you can't do anything. So Marino worked out this, this psychodrama system where he would get them to do a play, basically. They would take on the role of their mothers and their fathers and their sisters and their brothers and the, the people in their family who they were having trouble with, they would play those roles. And then when they played the roles, and they would switch occasionally and play different roles. And then one of the kids would play the other kid's mother and stuff like that. And then, but by doing this role playing, uh, what was really going on would start happening and coming out. Um, and then Marino started a uh, theater in New York called the Psychodrama Theater. It was quite successful for several years, where the audience would, would be the, the players. Uh, they take something like the day's New York Times and pick out a story. And people would just come on, up on the stage and take rules from that story and just play it out there on the stage. And he caused them to switch roles and do things like that. And pretty soon they're, 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 they're bringing some enlightenment into that kind of sterile story that's in the New York Times. Um, it became a therapeutic thing for adults also. It's been used in therapy. But the, the thing that is so powerful about it for, uh, for using it with lawyers is uh, it helps lawyers understand who they are uh, by going through the psychodrama process, but also to understand what's going on with judges and witnesses and jurors and, 
and you get a chance in the psychodrama process to play those various roles, and you can feel what it's like to be a juror if you're being a jury, and you can feel what it's like to be a witness if you're being a witness, and, and that'll give you a little more sympathy about uh, why is it important to understand the emotion the jurors are going to feel? Why is it uh, important to understand the emotion that the judge is going to feel? To, to a great extent, what we're doing in the courtroom, in the courtroom is we are, um, we are trying to sell a product, basically. And uh, to, to successfully sell a product to a person, you need to make them want that product. Um, so you've got to understand. Just you know, you can you can do a board dire of a jury, and in addition to the kind of things I've been talking about, you can you can start to get a feel of who that person is and what it is that they're interested in and what it is that motivates them and, and what it is they'll respond to and um, what kind of questions are going on in their heads as they're sitting there. Um, one thing that, uh, that, that's obvious uh, when you think about it is one of the things that is always on a juror's mind is what am I going to tell my husband, my wife, my children about what I did in this case? How am I going to tell them? And what am I going to tell them? And I feel like, you know, if you're any kind of lawyer, you have an obligation to help them with you know, give them right. a story. Give them a story to tell them they will. And uh, by doing that, you can raise an argument in case in a way that's useful and powerful. But, so yes, knowing what all those players are thinking and what they're doing and what their fears are uh, is, is awfully important in, in presenting a case that, that you can be successful at and have to help people understand your point. Talked to, mentioned a uh, use of the phrase storytelling just now in, in describing the ability to communicate to the jury, uh, giving them a story they could tell and be proud of. Yes. What is, what, what is the storytelling? How does that fit into the trial of the case? <clears throat> From as early as anybody can remember, in their lives, they've been interested in stories. Uh, kids are always saying to their parents, tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story. People love to hear stories. And um, so they are, human beings are way back in history, as long as far back in, as we can go. The story has played a huge role in, in, in societies. The history of many cultures is, is a story form of history. That's all it is. It's oral. It's, it's stories. And the storytellers in those cultures have been very important people. But there's something in the makeup of a human being that that makes them like to hear stories, and, and, and they like to operate in story format. They like to hear things in story format. So if you, if, if, you know, the worst thing you can be in the courtroom is a boy. People don't like lawyers, they, but they do like storytellers. So if you are there as a storyteller, if you are there as someone who's trying to help them uh, deal with what has got to be a god-awful, horrible uh, task for them to deal with, I mean, we ask them to do some pretty uh, important things in that car, just dragging them off the street and say, here's what you're going to do now. Uh, you recognize they come in there frightened, they don't know what they're supposed to do. They they're looking for somebody to help guide them. So, you know, all of a sudden somebody says, here's, let me tell you a story about this case. Let me tell you what about. Here's a story. Once upon a time. All of a sudden they say, oh, I know what once upon a time. Thanks for coming. So, you're now, so you're going through jury selection and evolving into feelings and then being a storyteller. Yes. And you're teaching your lawyers to be a storyteller. Yes. Is that, is that new in these? Yes. And how did it go over? Well, Stan, I think I think between the stuff that we did with Kathy Bennett and the stuff that we did with Jerry and the psychodrama, we really changed the way cases are tried in this country. 
there are people using the techniques that we developed over those years all over this country. They have no idea where it came from. A lot of them don't have any idea where it came from. Uh, they just heard it from somebody else that is in their city, you know. Or they watched somebody else in their city do a word I heard. They said, oh God, that's kind of neat. I'm going to do it that way. And it's just kind of spread that way. It's just, uh, so you go off to, uh, go off to any state in the union and walk into a courtroom, you're likely to see a lawyer there using techniques that came out of, out of what we did in college and what we, we did at the, the Trial Lawyers College in, in the Dubois. And they don't even know either one of those exist. You know. <laughs> but that's what we wanted to have. Or the Jack, John Ackerman exists. That's right. But we, that's, what we try, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we wanted. You, one of the things that struck me as you were talking is that at an early age, or early in your practice, you're committed to being a defense attorney. Yes. Why? I think it's the I think it's the pinnacle of what it means to be a lawyer. Um, we live in a country that is founded on um, individual freedom. That's 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 what made this country. Why it exists, and but why you thinking of the banner for individual freedom? Where did it come from? I maybe mean, I don't know. It, it may have come from growing up on the, the plains and the hills of Wyoming, uh, out there in the country where you know the, the ranchers and farmers of Wyoming are a bunch of people who really value freedom and, and protect it pretty pretty strongly. Uh, it's a lot different from the cities in, in America in that regard. And maybe that was part of it. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't know where it all came from. It's obviously part inside me. There was something that made me uh, get outraged when I, when I saw some of the things government was doing to people. Well, unfairly. Like what? <coughs> In the, in the criminal process, Stanley, there are just huge amounts of unfairness that, that go on. Um, and, you know, I'm talking to lawyers basically, so I don't need to tell anybody that. Uh, criminal defense lawyers know that. And uh, that's what you're doing all the time, is fighting unfairness. Uh, prosecutors overcharge, uh, prosecutors cheat. Uh, uh, the law is unfair many times. Uh, we don't claim to value freedom, but we don't value it like we should. During the 80s, was there any particular case that stands out in your mind as something that pinnacle of, of what you were doing or were you applying your... Oh, not really. Not, 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 not really. I think, I think the Brzezinski case was an interesting case. Uh, that was early 90s, wasn't it? That was early, that was early 90s. And that was a, a doctor that the FDA was after. Um, and again, it was a, it, it, it impinges on that, that, that concept of, you know, freedom. Um, when we do have to regulate the medical profession in, in a kind of do no harm way, but what they were doing with Brzezinski was outrageous. You know, he wasn't hurting anybody. He was actually helping a lot of people. And they put him in jail because he was not following their silly little rules. And we, we won. I mean, we, we stopped him. <laughs> you know? uh, and again, you just appeal to the basic nature of human beings as they're lovers of freedom, too. You just have to, you have to overcome their fears. That's all. You became a judge. Yes. Why did you want to become a judge? I thought maybe I could do more as a judge than I had been able to do as a lawyer. And you must know, I think every criminal defense lawyer knows that it's very frustrating at times. You, you feel like you're banging your head against the wall and you're trying to change the world and you're not even changing your own, your own little part of it. Um, so maybe if you could 
sit there as a judge and deal with case after case after case every day, maybe you could make an impact that would be a little better than what you're making standing in front of him uh, uh, moaning about things every day. Uh, so I thought that might be worth doing and, and managed to get appointed by the governor to the bench for a very short period of time. I was only there for six months and, and then lost the election. Um, and it was an interesting six months. I, I'm glad that I went through it and uh, I learned that it wasn't something I wanted to do any longer. I'm kind of glad I lost that election. <laughs> About that same time, uh, Trialers College uh, was formed. Yeah, right around there somewhere. Because the first Trialers College was in 94. Uh, were you involved in helping create that? Yes. Uh, how'd that come about? Jerry had been talking for several years about trying to start a college. discovering the power of psychodrama kind of helped him along that line. Um, and he had this ranch up in Dubois that uh, kind of got tired of being a rancher and decided that would be a perfect place to have a school. The cell phones don't work there. No. <laughs> so he converted, he had a huge old barn on there and he converted that into a classroom and he built some, uh, some dormitory space and some some other buildings were converted into classrooms, and off we went. Uh, we started the uh, first year and, and went every summer. Uh, we, kept, uh, we kept making it better. I mean, every day, every day after uh, the sessions for the day, the entire group of us that were trying to make it work would meet, and we, we might meet for two or three hours and talk about what we did that day that worked and what we did that didn't work. And, and how we might do this different, might be that different. And uh, it, it evolves, it evolved, I think not slowly, I think it evolved pretty fast. Because we were learning so much as we were doing it. Because the first time we had, we had a group of people in a confined space, and we were totally dedicated to using the psychodrama techniques. And, and all of a sudden we were using it in a completely different way than we had started out using. Uh, well, we, all of a sudden we realized that you, you, it wasn't just doing individual psychodramas with people, uh, the people there that would help them, but using some of those techniques to do the things you do in a case. Using techniques of psychodrama to do war diaries, using techniques of psychodrama to examine witnesses, using techniques of psychodrama to argue to a jury using techniques of psychodrama to understand your case. You and I have done several together where we've done these reconstructions, uh, where we get the client together with a bunch of people and we reenact uh, as much as possible what happened. And it gives you un unbelievable insight into what went on in the case. The client will say things that you wouldn't have ever heard that person say in those kinds of situations. And so you learn stuff about the case that really helps you. We even did a psychodrama with a psychiatrist who was going to testify about an insane defense. That's right. That's right. Uh, that worked. It did. It worked perfectly. Uh, but so you're now building it on a new area of really introducing the concept of psychodrama to the trial of a case, a civil case or a criminal case. Yes. And really putting this new concept of psychodrama to work. Yes. And it's the evolution of what, 20 years of work. I guess so. And then all of a sudden, you stop that and you say, time for a new career. <laughs> <laughs> I had a grandfather who changed about every seven years what he was doing in life. Well, Maybe you, it's in my genes. Then. Right, well, you, 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 were, you were doing this incredible creative work in the area of teaching lawyers and criminal law and applying psychodrama to the practice of law. And all of a sudden you say, you buy United States, mm -hmm. you buy juries, uh, you buy whatever thing I've known about the practice of law, and I'm going to go play on a whole new playing field. Yeah. And you're off to Europe. That's right. And you go to the Hague. Mm -hmm. And you take your first case and your first trial begins.
talking in sometime what, 98, 99? 97. We have 97, I think. Yes, May of 97. Uh, and you're all of a sudden doing international criminal law. What was that like? Well, it was radically different. Uh, no juries. You, know. you wrote a, a book on international criminal procedure. Yeah. Uh, I think you told me once that the last rules of procedure that were created for the tribunal were in the, in the Nuremberg trials. That's right. There weren't any, there really weren't any rules. Uh, 50 years it was all in the hands of academics because there weren't any uh, international criminal law trials. Uh, so the ones at the ICTY were the first ones that came around in years. And uh, so they created some very minimal rules. And, uh, there just wasn't anything out there to be involved with them all. And uh, so as we started doing the trials, you know, if something comes up almost every day and it's not in the rules. And uh, the question is, how are we going to deal with this? So the first few years there were, were exciting from the standpoint of, of being able to make law, being able to influence the making of law. Where, you know, here, everything's pretty well set. You don't get to make much law. <coughs> and if you do, it's mostly bad luck. That's true. Uh, but uh, uh, over there, we could make some pretty good law. But, uh, for instance, we spent uh, we spent uh, two days dealing with the issue of whether or not uh, the prosecution could force handwriting exemplars from the, from the cubes. And uh, the, the court asked us to brief it, and then we spent a day of argument on it. And they agreed with the defense that they can violates uh, the right to remain silent. So the rules that were being adopted by the, this international tribunal are quite different than the concept of due process or fairness in the United States. They're different in a lot of ways, and, and most of the differences are bad ones, but uh, because of what they've done is they've kind of gathered up law from all over the world, and uh, the judges have fought with each other about it, and they finally come up with compromises about what they want to do, and then, um, I think it was, the judges get together twice a year and, and consider a lot of things, but among the things they consider is whether they want to amend the rules or not, change the rules. And Judge Cassese, who was the first president of the tribunal, after the third such meeting, after they changed the rules the third time, said this is probably the last time we'll ever have to change the rules. So Right now, they've changed them twice a year. <laughs> year since then. I think we're on version number 26. Or are the same rules being applied in the, the uh, Arusha Tribunal, or are they making up their own rules? They're to, to a lot of to, to some extent the same rules are being applied because the appeals chamber for both courts are the same judges, and so to a great extent the rules are the same. Why do you go to Europe? Um, it was my wife's fault. Um, Your wife's fault? I got a call from uh, a lawyer that had been in my office in Houston uh, who was over there and said, we need a, a new lead counsel in a case that's been in trial only two weeks. And can you help me find somebody? So I started calling people around Houston to see if anybody would be interested. And I went home and mentioned it to my wife, Barbara. And she said, you'd be a fool if you didn't do it yourself. Uh, these things come around about every 50 years, as I can tell. Can't wait another 50 years. And I said, okay, you're right. And at the time we thought it was a six month commitment, probably. Yeah. And that was 11 years ago. <laughs> I'm still here. Well, was, what's it been like trying these cases? It's been a, it's been a really fascinating experience, Stan. Uh, it's a totally different thing from anything I ever did here. I shouldn't say totally, but uh, largely different. There's no jury. We try it to a panel of three judges. Um, they're the, the judge and the jury. Um, you have to deal with witnesses who don't speak your language, so you're dealing with translation with everything you do. Uh, and some translation gets screwed up about half the time, and the translation don't come out properly. So you deal with that. And, uh, 
But if you like standing on your feet in the courtroom, if you like doing cross-examinations, it's the greatest place in the world to be because you can cross-examine the witness today. I've been to your office in, in the day, and uh, you really taken technology uh, into the courtroom. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very high-tech courtroom. Um, and most recently, they adopted a system called eCourt, which uh, is made by a company in Australia. But everything we do is electronic. Uh, all the exhibits are. There's no, no exhibits are in the courtroom in paper form. They're all electronic. Uh, if you want to get an exhibit in the case, you first have to put it in the system and get it in the system. All the, the transcript is, is there all the time. And I've got a little key thing in my pocket so I can sit at the computer here and get into eCourt and look at all the exhibits in the case, look at all the transcripts in the case. Uh, everything. It's all completely electronic and completely. And that's, that's fascinating. So. And so I've seen you have like four or five screens going at the same time with different documents and yes. you're able to interact on it. You think that's what something you can bring to the United States judicial system? Uh, yeah, I, I mean that system would be fantastic here. It would really work great here. The problem is that it's expensive and getting the powers that be in some of our counties in the United States to pay for it is you know, fairly unlikely. You have to have a pretty good tech staff to keep it running. So you have to have a lot of new employees and stuff like that. That's one thing they weren't sure of when there was money. They had plenty of money to do it. Guys. So now you've been practicing law for 44 years. You've changed the way you practice law as lawyers for a well, I've had a little role in it, you know, I think. Uh, impacted many people. What do you think about your career? It's been um, been and continues to be uh, fascinating to me. I mean, I, uh, uh, I've done a lot of different things today. Um, I'm starting out as a wet behind the ears lawyer in Casper, Wyoming, uh, trying to figure out what a lawyer is to you know, doing some pretty interesting international trials over in the Hague, representing generals. So, been interesting. It's a long way from uh, Bosnia to Casper, Wyoming. It's a long way from Sundance, Wyoming to today. <laughs> it really is. You enjoy it? I've, I've enjoyed virtually every minute of my career as a lawyer. It's, it's, it's always been fascinating. Always been fascinating. Now you get frustrated at times, and you get frustrated with judges, you get frustrated with this, that, and the other, but it's. Uh, you know, I, I see people that are in jobs that, that are boring as hell, and, and I just thank God I'm doing something that is a brand new challenge every day. It keeps me going. So now that you've uh, been a lawyer for 44 years, what's your next career? <laughs> I don't know. I've got, I've got two or three books in my head that may or may not get written. I've got... Uh, I do a lot of uh, photography. I really enjoy my photography stuff. And I, I have little dreams about a gallery of my pictures uh, somewhere. Maybe publishing a book of pictures. I don't know. I'm looking forward to having you know, some time to do that. We just we just finished, uh, not quite finished yet, a two-year trial. We're in court virtually every day, 240 days in trial. 24,000 pages of transcript. I've been busy. I haven't had time to do it. You know, so I'm kind of looking forward to it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I have talked about you being a trial consultant. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing, too. I, I like doing that kind of stuff. I like doing, uh, um, you know, just listening to people's case and maybe giving them some ideas that would help them, maybe help them prepare a witness here and there, or prepare an argument, or just, you know, some stuff like that. You've been doing that your whole life? I have. I have. Almost my whole life. It's been kind of an interesting career as a child. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I've been president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Right. Um, dean of the National College for Criminal Defense. 
do international TV kinds of things. I've gotten married to national television. National television? Yeah. How did that happen? Well, um, I had met the woman I'm married to, Barbara, because she was from New York. And uh, I did an interview with NBC uh, in New York at one point, and then they didn't run it because the issue didn't come before the uh, American Bar. And in February, they then brought it up at the American Bar meeting in Atlanta. And I had flown home from Atlanta and called Barbara in New York. And as she picks up the phone and starts talking to me, I appear on her television set. And she decided anybody with that kind of magic was somebody she wanted to call. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then she moved to Houston. Yeah. And she's a lawyer. She works in the city attorney's office in Galveston. Fantastic career, John. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And now I've got a daughter who's a lawyer. And she's sitting right over there. And, uh, it was really exciting to stand uh, yesterday sitting in uh, Rusty Duncan and sitting next to me was my lawyer daughter. <laughs> it's like a dream come true. Well, it is. John, thank you for participating in this interview. Thank you. Glad to be here.